Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Cup Reviews, brought to you by Cup of Hemlock Theater. I am your host, Marketing Manager Mackenzie, and I am joined today by a fantastic panel as we dive into one of the most, I would say, iconic and famous plays we've covered so far, and it is none other than Angels in America Part 1, Millennium Approaches starring Nathan Lane as Roy Cohn and Andrew Garfield as Pryor. So we are going to dive into this, but to do that with me, I have a great panel, many faces you will recognize. First off, we have Ms. Alicia Plummer coming back for, I don't know how many episodes she's been on now. She's like, she's almost a regular here. <laughs> yes, it's lovely to be welcomed back. I am very excited to get into Angels America. In America, I'm I'm happy to see some familiar faces. I know everyone here now, so it's it's yeah. really great. And mm -hmm. I am drinking coffee, the classic coffee. Yes, this is a very early recording in the morning, so caffeinated drinks are encouraged, yes. or a mimosa, one of the two. We, next up, we have returning to us Graham McClelland. Hello, Graham. Hello, Mackenzie. Good to be back for my third panel with Cup of Hemlock. I'm oh, so happy to be included again. Uh, well, you are a great presence to have. I mean, it's, right from your first episode uh, on our Shakespeare and Gender Roundtable, you made an impression. Our viewers just wanted to have you back. Especially talking about this amazing, iconic play. Mm -hmm. Angels in America is such a like mainstay hallmark of queer theater. Um, yes. And it's something that I've been longing to sink my talents into for quite some time. So I'm happy for the opportunity. And in my cup, which is actually a bottle, I just have good old fashioned H2O because nice. hydration is key. And it is early in the morning. So when mm -hmm. someone in the like pre-panel discussion was like, yeah, if you want to have anything alcoholic, I'm like, it is nine in the morning. <laughs> I am not going to have anything alcoholic. Mimosas. I guess vitamin C orange juice. Exactly. Exactly. Sugary vitamin C and alcohol. Can't beat that. And then joining us all the way back from her Romeo and Juliet review, she now gets to come back once again. It is my co-host of our other podcast before the downbeat, the Canadian B. Arthur, the John Adams of theater, Ms. Autumn Smith. Hello, Autumn. Hello, Mackenzie. I love that that uh, that introduction carried over. Thank you. Good. Um, I too have coffee, but I just recently bought a foamer, Ooh. so I'm having foamed oat milk in my coffee, and Let's I'm double see. fisting because I also have H2O in the very chic mason jar. Ooh, Ooh very fancy. Nice. Right? Mm -hmm. Doing it well, up. Doing it up. Well, love that. Well, I'm drinking my morning cup of Earl Grey tea for my official The Cup cup. Nice. There. Yes. So I'm drinking that. And then I too am double fisting with my tankard of water. So. And what are the people on your virtual background drinking? I looks like they're probably drinking like some type of champagne. I know they're having our mimosas. Exactly. Well, Nathan Lane is anyway. I don't, I don't know if Joe is. I don't know if Joe drinks. <laughs> I don't think so. He's a Mormon. <laughs> he, ah. <laughs> he's very religious. He's very yes. linear. Yeah. Um, it, mind you, he goes on a journey. He goes on a journey in this play. Two by oh, two, goodness. marching door two. Door. I know. Sorry, wrong show, wrong show. That is all I could think about when I was watching this was I was thinking like, Book of Mormon, Book of Mormon, Book of Mormon, Book of Mormon, Book of Mormon. <laughs> like tap um, dancing, tap dancing in um, Uganda. <laughs> yep. <laughs> just so turn good. it off, Mackenzie. Just turn it off. Turn it off. <laughs> I like a light switch. <laughs> Let's talk about this show, Angel in America Part One from National Theater. And first off, we're going to talk about which character slash track was best performed. And Autumn, I'm very intrigued to find out who you thought was Why the best performance, considering you only said there were three people that stood out to you in this entire piece. <laughs> oh. Yes, yeah. there were. Are you ready? I'm ready. Look, 
I don't know the actors' names, and I feel like I should have written it down. But I have the cast list here. Hold on. on, I will pull it up. I have the cast list. I can look. Um, the first person I would like to mention the track is the Hannah Pitt track. Yes, Mama Pitt. Yes, played uh, by Susan Brown from Game of Thrones. Yes, she had me at her rabbi. Mm. And as I watched that rabbi speech at the beginning, I was like, oh, this is going to be extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And I said to Sarah, I'm like, okay, I'm stopping. I'm going to wait for you to watch this because everyone should watch this. Mm -hmm. And then I watched the next scene and I'm like, no, I'll just continue watching it. Um, so Susan Brown, definitely the simplicity, actually the simplicity in all three of these performances mm -hmm. is what captivated me about them. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that they allowed things to drop in mm -hmm. rather than pushing them on the audience is what sold me on these three performances. So Hannah Pitt track, mm -hmm. the angel track. Whoever yes. plays the angel, what is her name? I believe. Hold on. Hold on. I, hold on. I, 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 Amanda I see Lawrence. Yes. I have extraordinary. Amanda Lawrence. Mm -hmm. e extraordinary. Like this woman needs to be playing everything. And it's everything was so nuanced. Her mm -hmm. um, person, her homeless person was mm -hmm. some of the best acting I have ever seen. Yes. And her tracks with Susan Brown mm -hmm. were, and they kept meeting. And yep. I love that, that the way that that intersected, I thought it was brilliant, brilliant. Mm -hmm. And then the last person I want to mention is Belize. Yes. And he, again, um, dropped like just let nathan stewart uh uh yes. jarrett this like he, genius actor mm -hmm. and should receive top billing because his work he let things land mm -hmm. he let i wouldn't have cared if this production had been four hours i'm gonna say that now it's a long production i know i'm in it for the long haul but he let things land and I, I loved it. I love the, his closeness with Pryor. I just, I, I loved it. I really loved it. Those are the three I will mention. Okay. Alicia, I saw you nodding along there. So who is getting your shout out? Uh, yes, I was nodding along with what Autumn was saying, um, but we do have different lists. Uh, I put down James McArdle who played Lewis. Um, I, I think he was the first person in the show that really, uh, made me zoom into the show a bit more. And I was like clued in on his mannerisms as Lewis and he was just so frazzled and I, I just found him really fun to watch. But then there was a scene where I started to stop liking him as a character and that made me stop like looking at him as like as as he was performing because mm -hmm. i just started to think maybe let me see the other actors now and i think it was the scene where um lewis and belize were having that conversation about racism mm -hmm. and racism in america specifically and then i started to look at andrew garfield a bit more i wasn't looking at andrew garfield at first who played prior um mm -hmm. because i found him extremely distracting He's just, he's Andrew Garfield, and I just know him as, he played Spider-Man in that movie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hats, Hacksaw Ridge, he's, he, he's a very accomplished actor. Yes, and uh, I was just like, oh, it's Andrew Garfield. Like, I, I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking of you as, as Spider-Man right now. But at, <laughs> by the end of the play, I was so, I was so, like, in it with him, and I wasn't looking at him as Andrew Garfield anymore. I just saw him as Pryor mm -hmm. and he was so like, I, I'm trying to explain how I was feeling, but Angels in America is such a powerful, intense, provocative piece mm -hmm. that I'm finding it hard to find the words. 
but uh, yeah, I think Andrew Garfield kind of uh, took took it away for me. I, I didn't know he was a stage actor. Um, and I think that's also, I was surprised to see him in this role, especially since he was playing a gay man. Um, and he started to fall more and more into this uh, fantasy uh, delusional state. And I was just captivated by how he was playing that and portraying that. Mm -hmm. Those are my thoughts. Love that. Love that. Well, don't worry. We, we, we will get to Andrew Garfield. I have thoughts on him. Oh, in a I bit. know you do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Graham, who was your shout out? Oh, I, I think I can't help but mention Nathan Lang because honestly, mm -hmm. his performance in every scene went from like something that was really kind of funny in the first scene to that really intense, like his final scene of the play with um, Ethel Rosenberg. Mm -hmm. um, and just, he brings it to every performance. He brought it to every scene. And there was like this nuance as you see him go from this like powerful lawyer who's like on top of the world and like in complete control to someone who's fairly broken by the end of the play, like broken, but not defeated. Um, and it, it was just, in, I love Nathan Lane. <laughs> like I, I was- Me too. <laughs> I was shocked when I saw, cause I knew Andrew Garfield was in this production but I didn't know anyone else in the production. Mm -hmm. So when I saw that Nathan Lane's picture was on the, um, on the- like, Poster? The, the poster. I was like, oh my God, now I really have to watch this. And I just sat down and yeah, I adored his performance top to bottom. Um, and I will give a shout out to uh, ba, 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 Russell Tovey, because I mm. thought that, I thought that he brought a good intensity to, to uh, Joe. And also, mm -hmm. I, I just, I thought that he also, again, from that first scene, one thing I really like is a character's transformation over the course of a play. And Joe really goes from someone who takes objection to Roy Cohen, um, taking the Lord's name in vain, like he's such a good boy at the beginning and then over the course of the play he goes to almost like getting a physical brawl with Roy in that in that last scene um between them so I love how he, he went from like he started the play one way and he slowly like transformed over the course of the play so he was fascinating to watch and I will also give a shout out to Denise Goff her performance was also fantastic um, not so much from that I know what it's like to be a Valium addict or I have friends who are Valium addicts, but bringing that kind of mania and the frantic delivery of lines, but I also, I understood every line. It wasn't like it got lost in a jumble. So she was able to bring that energy and bring that intensity while also kind of caring for the audience and like, she's not running too fast for her mouth to keep up with. Mm -hmm. So therefore like all of her, I, I got all of her points and was able to be like, huh, Harper, you're saying some pretty interesting things that I want to make note of. Like, I think mm -hmm. most of my notes throughout were either about Pryor or Harper um, for different mm -hmm. reasons, but mm -hmm. yeah, so that's what I'll say. Well, Graham, I will piggyback off you because my shout out was also Nathan Lane. I know Autumn shakes her head. But I, I thoroughly enjoyed his performance in this. Like, Roy Cohn is a tough character to play because he can come across as a really two-dimensional, oh, he's the bad Republican. Mm -hmm. That's just awful. And don't get me wrong, Roy Cohn as a person was an absolutely horrible, horrible human being who did horrible, horrible things, including getting a woman executed. <laughs> Uh, by bribing a judge. Not a nice man, in the slightest. But what Nathan Lane did, I found, was he made me ping pong on this character. Like, on one hand, I was hating Roy Cohn. Then at one point, I was laughing with, with him at the, at, at the beginning phone scene. And then it was the doctor's office scene, where, where, where he goes, I am not gay, I am Roy Cohn. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and, it, and it was, and, it, and, and that's what my pity and, and kind of like the underbelly humanity of who this man is, that he has such anger and hate for himself and who he is, that he's willing to just destroy anything that reminds him of that world. 
and do everything in his power to rip that world apart. And the anger and just the venom that he's able to do. But at the same time, you're going, oh, you've made me understand you a bit better. You're not just evil Roy Cohn. You are a man who has a shit ton of self-loathing built up inside him that he just can't get, 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 get through. And that's why he does what he does. And that's what I liked about Nathan Lane was he wasn't just <laughs> evil Roy Cohen. I can't wait till you, you kind of die off in part two. Spoiler alert for, uh, for the play. <gasps> well, it's kind yeah. of a given. That's given. That's given. <laughs> right, yes. That he's going to die. He, he is going to die. But it's like, once again, like what he does, like the Washington scene here, horribly indefensible dark side of politics that Roy is acting in. But at the same time, you have the other scenes where there's just, Nathan just brought great complexity. And I mean, Autumn, when you and I were talking yesterday, you were like, it's like, it's like an evil version of Max Bialystok. And I was like, no, it's just Max Bialystok. <laughs> I mean, it's just Max Bialystok. Wait, I want to, I want to retract that. Okay. Because by the time I had spoken to you, I didn't see his last scene. And I was like, okay. When he finally got to the last scene of this play, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, Nathan Lane might be able to act. He can't act. No, no, he performs. And there's a very fine difference between mm. acting and performing. And up until that, that scene, that final scene, not even this scene in the restaurant, but the, the final scene where he's on the floor with Ethel Rosenberg and mm -hmm. even with Joe, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, oh, you know what stakes are in the scene. Mm -hmm. This is now interesting. What would happen if you did the whole play in this place? That's mm -hmm. what I thought. Because the, uh, you have more questions. I'm not gonna get on this, but there is, Graham's got something, the, his hand just yeah. went up. <laughs> just just something I want to piggyback off of. I feel like that's going to be a word that's going to come up a lot. But yep. um, if, if the entire play was performed from that place in the last scene, I wonder, um, now, I wonder how much of the performance is Nathan Lane's autonomy as an actor, like in the process, and how much of it was the director asking him to be Roy Cohn, the performer, because I believe like, Roy Cohen as a character is highly performative, is a lot of like the display and the performance of power. And so therefore traveling through the play, eventually getting to that point of vulnerability where the performance, like the mask finally falls down when mm -hmm. Joe comes to see, like, it, like, could that be a way of viewing the character in the play? Absolutely. And Graham, that's a great point. I think absolutely. Roy Cohn is a performance of himself all the time. He's he's essentially doing a drag version of himself for the benefit of the, the justice system. However, I think the way that Nathan Lane brought it, there was too much of a queer sensibility to buy that Republican side for me. And in, in that time period, that people would have been like, what are you doing? But you know? Roy Cohn says that because he was so powerful nobody ever cared how out he really was like the fact there are pictures of him with young men at parties and going to clubs and nobody yes. cared but so he could be flamboyant mm, but he wasn't he was a republican and you cannot be a flamboyant republican those two things do not marry and to the rest of the world roy Cohn was straight passing mm. so there has to be that and the more you try to pass and hide your identity, the more hardened and resentful you become of that piece of yourself that you are hiding, which makes it more interesting to watch. Hmm. Fact That's on that, you know, pers personal experience triggered there. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. for, for me too. Mm -hmm. like the more you try to hide yourself, the the more that the more potent that scene in the doctor's office then becomes. Mm -hmm. And I think the act of trying to hide it also allows the humor to come out naturally instead of forced, which I felt mm -hmm. 
it did for a lot of this production and not just in Nathan Lane. Interesting. Interesting. All right, we're going to dive more into this as we go along. Okay. Let's get into what our favorite production or design element was. Graham, you can go first on this one. I have to say lighting. And that's mm. going to be something I bring up a lot just because I thought that it was a great way. The lighting designer is a genius because the use of shadows was absolutely brilliant mm. in this play. It created, in my mind, I was always looking at it as what kind of stakes are presented. And oh, as the play went on, it seemed like the shadows got longer and the shadows got bigger. And it's kind of like the shadow of death, the shadow of uncertainty, the shadow of uh, even each other, like human nature that I saw in every scene. And it was like these were characters emerging from the shadows just to give their scene and then they disappear into the darkness and another character would show up. So I, I have to say the lighting throughout the entire piece really jumped out at me, but especially in the last scene, there were these very like long shadows and I really appreciated mm -hmm. the shadow play. Yeah, I get, I get, I get that. Yes, I agree. Autumn, I see you nodding along. So are you in agreement about the lighting? No. <laughs> it's, oh, I hated it. I hated it because I'm like, can't, what's happening? I found it very dark. There's nothing worse than really there were points, like I just found the whole thing, it's gonna sound really bad, but I found the whole thing one noted. And that was reflected in the lighting design. And I, I, like, I understand that, I understand New York in that time period, the neon, I get it. But for the stage, I found it very, I found it hard to watch mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, I also, I, I liked, I liked the fluidity of the set. I liked the, the revolves. I thought those were interesting, mm -hmm. but I hated the direction of this play. So I find it really hard to talk about any of the set elements. What I will mention is the costume design. I thought the costume design was fantastic. So I'm gonna stick with costume design okay. uh, because I thought it was accurate. That snowsuit that she comes out in in Antarctica, <laughs> I thought was magical, and I loved I love this inter I love the interpretation of the angel coming from the depths, the bowels of hell, and this kind of raggedy. Uh, expanse of wings. I thought that like that was fantastic. And the fact that it was manipulated by other people, I thought that was genius. Mm. So I will go costume. Costume. Mm -hmm. Fair. Alicia. Um Adam kind of got me thinking a bit about the costumes in the show. And yeah, you're right. The costumes are so well done and so specific to that time period of like the mid eighties kind of style. Uh, but what I originally wrote down was the moving stage that happened. Mm. I, Autumn, did you mention the revolves? Is that yeah, the revolves, said? yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the three yeah. revolves. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So the revolves that were happening during, um, like to split up and divide scenes, I found that really really fluid and really effortless and i i just i liked how easy it was to just watch one scene change to the next um also i don't know if this is i think this falls into production slash design it's it might be more so a direction but uh the scene when uh joe prior lewis and harper are all on stage but mm. two different scenes are happening Mm -hmm. um I I really loved it was like it was a, during an argument scene I think in uh, act one yeah I really loved to see how it was just really cool to see both scenes happening at the exact same time and mirroring each other mm -hmm. I think that falls into production that that yeah. falls into production well once again it's the execution of that moment and it was the production design that helped get that mm -hmm. moment to to, to work because yes. cross-cutting scenes, is ne it can become, become very messy, as we all know. It can become very unclear and 
and become muddled but the yeah yeah the way the way that the way this set was designed because i'll piggyback alicia because mm-hmm. i also had a set designed by ian um mcneil uh was just incredible the three turntables were just so mesmerizing just to watch them spin like three separate worlds that are now all colliding into one and uh, one another and creating this kind of collision world where all of a sudden all these people are now getting forced together it's kind of like a really dark version of falsettos the musical mm-hmm. where like where like everybody is kind of all forced together because of one action one event that all kind of in the fact that it's joe meeting um lewis yes yeah 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 he meets lewis right yeah yes in the yes. bathroom yes correct it's 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 once those it's once that moment happens everything else starts to spin and start meshing and grinding and grinding into each other and so i just loved watching the way those, those everything just kind of moved and just kind of the way everything all is kind of slugged together and just kind of showed how everything kind of bleeds off one another it's not i i i know one group is is can step aside and keep their hands clean everybody's in on this world the fact that lewis gets involved with joe who is a right-wing mormon closeted man like that just opens up a whole new area for Joe or or for Lewis, who then leaves Pryor, and then Pryor is in showing up in Harper's dreams. Then you got Roy, who's getting affected by Joe's moral dilemma because he's going to get disbarred. Like all these people, all seem to start um, mixing about here. So I absolutely love it. Uh, so perfect. All right. So now that we've all sung the praise of different elements of the production. Let's dive into what we thought was the weakest part of this production. And I know Autumn has quite a bit there, but I see Graham doing a malicious finger finger curl there. So Graham, I'll let you start this one because I just want to see what, like, where you're going to go with this. Okay, so in terms of what I thought was weakest, honestly, Andrew Garfield as a whole, I did not like his prior. I thought that he was overacting the whole time. He sounded like a bad Shakespearean actor. He sounded like he was like drawing out his lines. And like, I'm, I don't know if that was the direction or what he was doing, but I just hated him from start to finish. Um, I, I just, I, I cannot say enough bad things about his prior, honestly. Uh, Leash is I, so brokenhearted. As I said, like, yeah, I just, I thought that I didn't believe him. Mm-hmm. I'm like, have you, have you met? a gay man before like I know like it just did not seem like authentic to me it didn't mm-hmm. seem like, like it's I felt like I was watching a show I didn't feel like I was watching a person on stage like going through this experience and yes. there were definitely prior goes through a lot in both like both parts but yes he does I think the only times that I actually connected with him was the very last scene. Mm -hmm. Um, And there were, of course, like, of course I enjoyed moments that he was on stage and the moment in act three, where the, the burning book appears in the hospital room like that. I laughed like crazy Mm -hmm. in that whole section. But for the most part, yeah, for me, the weakest part was Andrew Garfield. So I'm sorry to the pretty boy, but just it, no just no graham i am with you on this i'm piggybacking on this one alicia's like no two people just wait just wait, maybe i don't be a third who knows <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be funny uh but yeah no andrew garfield oh no like his prior was just so big it was caricature and Graham, you're right. It's like, did he? It, it, it's like, has he ever actually met someone who's gay? Because like, this felt like Hank Azaria in the Birdcage, which is like the stereotype of what do you think somebody like this um, would act like? Like, it was so big and so broad, and he yells so much. Like, it's just a lot of yelling, a lot of yelling, and it's different than Nathan Lane yelling, Autumn. <laughs> It is different than an Asian lane yell. Hoggins like, no, it isn't. It's not different, but anyways. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like it's just he, he just was felt like in a totally different world of, of, of this piece where it was like, nobody else is with you, Andrew Garfield. 
Marion Elliott, I do not know what you were up to with Andrew Garfield in this character, who's supposed to be like the core of the show. That is supposed to be like driving this piece. <laughs> Having to sit through that, and especially when we get into, into part two where it's all the prophet stuff. I just sat there going, oh, dear God. Well, thank get you. Get me back to Roy. Get me back to oh. that storyline. Like, prior was just getting on my nerves in part two. So stay tuned for me to rant about that in part two. Um, <laughs> but, in, but in this part, at least there was a bit more of a balance between the other characters that it wasn't just about prior. Here, uh, like here, there was a, a way you, get, you could escape him for a bit in his overacting. But yeah. Autumn, go. Look at, I'm not just going to blame Andrew Garfield for overacting in this production. Other than the three people I have previously mentioned, there was so much chomping of the stage scenery. I, I couldn't stand it. I was so annoyed. And I was like, is this, this was my question. Is this a British director and British actors stereotyping what they think Americans act like. Nathan Lane is his own entity, his own overacting entity. But he is. That is who he is. He, he's, a, he's a scene chomper. Yeah. I don't find him funny. I don't find him relatable. I found him relatable in one scene of this. That's it. But everyone else, I just felt it very drum, dramatic. Like, like it was... I don't know. Denise, Denise Goff, even I'm like, this is not Harper. Harper is not this confident. She is a struggling Mormon woman who has been the backseat of a relationship. Her husband is struggling. Russell Tovey had no struggle. I'm like, okay, their relationship. He's misogynistic and condescending and I got none of that. I got none of that in this production. And I blame Marianne Elliott. I think, how can you up this play, this play, which is so complex and funny, but not funny the way she directed it. I did not find it funny. I found it slapsticky. Mm. And the humor was not well done in this play. It should be so subtle that the audience hardly knows they're laughing. It should be from discomfort. I just I just found it a lot of crying. I'm like, if one of these actors cries one more time, I'm turning it off. There was so much yelling. And so one thing I tell every single one of my acting students, once you go there, there's nowhere else to go. There's Unless you're Imelda Staunton and Gypsy. Nowhere to go. You have zero places. And they started yelling in the first scene. I'm like, okay, you've lost me for the next three hours. I hated, I hated it. That's, now I'm, now I'm ired. Now I'm ired. Uh-oh, we fired up Autumn now. <laughs> Alicia, give us your thoughts. So we've now Ooh. ripped apart Andrew Garfield. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, uh, a lot has been said. A lot has been stated in the past five minutes. <laughs> and a different world we're sitting now. <laughs> uh, a whole new world. The sad thing is I also have down Andrew Garfield in my weakest part of the production, but for a different reason. Um, I found him ex distracting because I know him from Spider-Man and that's kind of the image that I had. So in terms of, now in general, in terms of the casting of the show, I just found all these well-known actors. We already mentioned that Susan Brown is, uh, was in Game of Thrones yep. and Nathan Lane is very well-known. So I, I almost found like, the casting, because they are all these really well-known film actors, stage actors, that was distracting to the show. I, I almost wish that I was watching people that I didn't know at all. And like, honestly, I didn't really, I didn't really recognize them at first. It, I kind of, I kind of recognized Nathan Lane 
Of course, I recognize Andrew, but other than that, I didn't really recognize anybody else. But there's just something about watching a show where you don't know anybody and you can just see the show speak for itself. So I think that the element of casting all these very well-known actors, I found that kind of distracting for the production itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but overall, I, I really enjoyed the show. Like uh, out of all the things that I've reviewed on Cup of Hemlock, this has been my favorite to, to watch and I found it really easy to watch. Mm -hmm. Autumn, you mentioned that the actors were kind of chomping on their words and I know exactly what you mean by that. But I felt like with this show, it's so, the intensity made me feel like it worked. I, I felt like it worked that the actors were talking in their own way um, and the, the way they were expressing their feelings. It just felt like the show is so overly dramatic that I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be acted in that way. But I do have to agree with you, there was a lot of crying at times when I was like, okay, this is, this is like, I don't know if I need to see Lewis cry for the 13th time. He already left prior. We're done with you crying at this point. Um, so I do agree with you. There, there is, there were times when things were overacted just a little too much. Um, but I never felt like it took me out of the play. Mm -hmm. Something that I also wrote down was I felt like it, maybe some people might think that the show was long. It was on the longer side. It was about three and a half hours if we were sitting down watching it with it, the intervals, um, the intermissions. But I think the, the length of it, by the end of it, I wasn't distracted by how long it was because it ended so abruptly. Um, but other people might say like, oh, it was too, it's too long because not everyone likes a long show. I, per I like shows that are like 90 minutes, preferably. Um, but the length didn't distract me too, too much with this show. So those are my my thoughts. But overall, I, I really, I did enjoy this production. I liked yes. it a lot. Well, I mean, Autumn and Alicia, you kind of bled into the next question, which is, is this production worth the watching? So, Graham, I'll let you know, Tegan, because you haven't said it, whether or not you think this is worth the watching. And then also Alicia and Autumn will come back to you if you think part one is a standalone piece. Um. Mm -hmm. So, Graham, you start here. Is it worth watching? Mm hmm Okay. I think it's worth watching because I think that... Okay, actually, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it's worth watching if you like theater. If you <laughs> appreciate theater and you know what you're sitting down for when you mm -hmm. see a play... Mm -hmm. it's worth watching. But for most people who are more acclimatized to film, who are more acclimatized to shorter things, mm -hmm. I think that it goes on a little bit long. Uh, Autumn, a lot of the things you were talking about with the overacting, with the hiking emotion, with the melodrama. Now, I love me a good melodrama. Absolutely, like, I, I will die on the hill of melodrama. But mm -hmm. I agree that this went a little bit a little bit too hard too often. And it was just a lot for a three hour viewing. Mm -hmm. Like I, I watched it all in one sitting. So I was like, by the end of it, I was just fried. By the time act three was, you know, starting, I'm like, oh, there's two acts and this is what I thought going in. But I'm like, nope, there's three. It was just <laughs> a bit much. It was just, it went a little bit too far. It pushed past that point of, comfort into that point of okay what time is it i don't wear a watch and you know, i'm checking my <laughs> checking what time it is because it, it just yeah even i was getting bored by the end of it because i'm like well there's just no tonal variation between scenes like as we went on it just was getting more of the same and i think even melodrama has to have undulations of disposition as it goes through you have to have moments that are just unobjectively funny you have to have moments that are you know just more on the lighter side, like have like a couple little stabs of the drama, but for the most part is, you know, just something to cleanse the palate before you get back into something heavy. And this play is heavy. So I'd say it is worth watching for fans of theater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm, I'm conflicted now after our conversation about whether or not this is worth the watch. Originally I came in with a yes. It's worth the watch because I do love Nathan Lane. However, Thinking now more on the bigger picture of this production, 
And the fact that I also have the HBO miniseries with Al Pacino and Meryl Streep in my head, that is wonderful. I'm going, do I send people to watch the Al Pacino or do I send them to watch this stage show? And I think I would send, send them to watch the HBO thing first. Mm-hmm. And then go, hey, if you like that, come on over and watch the stage version if you are so inclined. Yeah, if I could jump in quickly, that was, I'd seen the HBO series before seeing this. So this is my first time seeing like a staged production. Mm -hmm. So I was coming off of the HBO series. So yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. So for me, I go, "Mm, I mean, the sets are really cool to watch. That's fun. Um, Nathan Lane, if you like Nathan Lane, like I do and Graham does, Sure, tune in to watch that because Rory actually gets a lot to do in this first part compared to the second part where he's kind of more sidelined. Um, and then to answer the last question of, is it a standalone piece? No. This piece is not a standalone piece. There are way too many open-ended questions that if you're coming in to watch part one, you better be time to watch part two because you're going to leave that going, I feel very unfulfilled. Yeah, I didn't get to answer whether it was a standalone piece or I forgot to answer that question. Yes. Like, I agree with you. Yeah, it isn't. Especially the way it ends, I'd be like... Yeah. And imagine, like, Tony Kushner left the audience on, like, a two-year hiatus, <laughs> like, as as part two is being finished. Like, oh, my God. Like, and people were upset. George R. R. Martin. Yeah, and, like, people were upset with, like, Game of Thrones seasons. And it's like, yeah, and then you rush people and this is what happens, season eight. But... <laughs> or whatever <laughs> but um but yeah no this this play is not a standalone piece it ends as abruptly as every scene in the play ends i feel like we're mid-conversation it's like oh there's the transition music and here we go into another scene and the, it ends just goes abruptly i'm like yeah no no and tony kushner what are you doing making people watch a two-part play i don't know that's a discussion for another day anyway sorry it's a ballsy move you better hope people come back for part two like Nicholas Nickleby, part one and part two. Like, I, I, you got to take the, like, if you're going to make somebody to go to a two party, you better be warranting that second part. Mm-hmm. If not, I'll be even going, was there no dramaturg on site that could have just like helped you edit this a bit? <laughs> Can you consolidate cannot it blame, You cannot blame Tony Kushner for being a brilliant writer. We're, I was never oh. blaming him for that. You are. You're saying, oh, you should have condensed it into. I didn't say. You know, I, I, I didn't say that. condense it. I said, <laughs> I said, if somebody goes for a part, you you better word it. I think Kushner does. Kushner le- Kushner leaves a got a lot of good things there to make you want to come back for a part two. But there's been other part two plays that you kind of go, uh, I don't know. So what? We just get the angel for a moment. For me, reading that, I'm like. <gasps> I now need to read Perestroika because you have me. What does this angel mean? Who is this angel? We have waited for this moment. We have built to this climax. Damn you, Kushner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, it, yeah, you, you build to that, right? Mm-hmm. But you can't, yeah. you can't, you know, and two years is fine because it's, you're, you hope that I I would hope when this came out that people went away and critically engaged their newspapers, their government systems, uh, how uh, AIDS was affecting America and the world at that time before Perestroika came out. Right. Mm-hmm. I think he's. Do you remember much when this play came out? Absolutely, I do. I will never forget. One of my highlight moments, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, but was when I saw it originally at Cannes stage before it became Canadian stage. Mm-hmm. <coughs> like I was in my 20s. And Steve Kuman um, played Prior Walter. It was a revelation at that time, like a revelation. And it was happening at that moment. The AIDS crisis was happening. People were dying in our community. They're still dying. We just don't talk about it as much, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But it was urgent. 
and it was necessary. And Kushner is a, he is, he is the Shakespeare of contemporary American theater. His, his sense of the poetic, his use of humor is, he's genius. It is such a beautifully crafted piece of work. So yeah, I remember it. I remember it well. I remember it being acted at the Tony Awards. Mm. Like they used to do little snippets of the plays and mm -hmm. it was there. Alicia, right. what are your thoughts on all this before we head into the next section? Um, the original question of do I think this production is worth watching and do I think part one is a standalone? Yes. Okay. Um, I kind of... I'm kind of on to what Graham said earlier about uh, if you are a person who loves theater, then definitely watch Angels in America, watch mm -hmm. this production in particular. Because I was telling my sister that I was watching the show and I was telling her everything that happened. And then she was just like, stop, this is sad. Please stop talking about it. And I was like, okay, I will stop. <laughs> because mm -hmm. it, it's a, a lot happens in this show. Mm -hmm. um, and also the show is very much of its time. They mention or it's mentioned of the new millennium approaching so mm -hmm. many times and like Y2K and all that. And I was kind of over that. So I think that's more so in the writing um, mm -hmm. because we're in 2021 right now. And it's like, OK, well, other things have happened since since then. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, there, there's a lot of talk about the AIDS crisis and um, LGBTQ issues being gay, Mormon, all that stuff. We're going to get more into that in the next discussion. In, later on in the discussion. Yes, I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there's a lot of heavy topics. But I, I think the show is worth watching if you, if you love theater. It's also mm -hmm. funny. There are some moments that I didn't expect to be funny that made me laugh. Um, and this production in particular is also very in your face. At the end of the show the camera man kind of scanned to the audience and you could see how intimate it was. Mm -hmm. And I would have loved mm -hmm. to be sitting in that audience in particular, because I was worried because with, with certain angles, it looked like we were so far away from the stage because we watched this a, a film production. Um, but knowing that the audience was fairly close, I think that would be really cool to be that close and that intimate with the actors and seeing everything happening on stage. Um, mm -hmm. At first I thought part one, honestly, I think part one could be a standalone piece. I've, I know uh, Angels in America part two exists. I've never read it or watched it, but now I want to. I'm very familiar with the first one. Um, and I think part one, I think it can be a standalone piece. I'm okay with it ending the way it did. Yes, it is shocking and surprising, but, um, but I, I also really want to watch part two now. So I don't know if I'm like, thoroughly okay with it but if someone <laughs> just wanted to be introduced introduced to tony kushner's work and introduced to these concepts then i think they could watch part one and walk away without watching part two and be okay with it mm -hmm. those are my thoughts love it love it well can i can i answer the qu i don't think i answered the question okay answer away i will go very quickly okay um i think that they should not watch this production. I think it does a disservice to the text. What I do think they should do is watch the HBO miniseries because it is genius. It's so Al Pacino, fun. Meryl Streep. Well, you know, and if it's your introduction to um, to this work, you can take <laughs> breaks from it. Mm -hmm. You can turn it off if it's too much. You can walk away from it. You can digest it bit by bit you can rewind and go back um and i i think that's important i think there's a lot it's a very dense text and i think some things get missed and i agree with alicia i think there there are things that are very dated in this so in a way it's become a period piece mm -hmm. but i think it's a crucial period piece mm -hmm. especially in pandemic times mm -hmm. That's all. So true. So true. Oh, Autumn, and is, it, and is this a standalone piece? No. No. I mean, it... it sure. It can be. Um, I guess. I don't know why you would. But mm -hmm. you, you can um, 
do it as a standalone piece. It's very long. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, I kind of like the open-endedness. The angel comes and you're like, oh, no. There, act there actually was an angel? What? Not just Pryor losing his mind? I know. I know. Is but he I dying? Is he, he is he going to survive? No, I'm going to change my answer. I think I think it can be left. Because you know what? I don't like neat. You know me. I like I know. mess. I like mess. And it leaves the audience going, what just happened? Who mm -hmm. are these people? Where are they going? But isn't that how a lot of dramas end? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. With questions? So, yeah. Look I at Doubt the Play. It ends with big questions. <sighs> big doubt. Mm. Patrick Shanley. John Packer Shanley is watching everything. That's what the whole, that whole play is about. Mm -hmm. Is who is right? Do we ever get to know another? We can never become another person. Yes, so we do right. not know the inner mechanics of their mind. Yeah. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. That is exciting. Yeah. Agreed. So, yes, I think it can stand on its own. I'm changing my answer. We're, autumn is changing. <laughs> Again, it's Mackenzie yeah. Warner's fault. I'll blame you. <sighs> <laughs> I do that. I know, Autumn. All right, let's get into more text-based questions because mm. Mr. Kushner gave us a lot to uh, chew on, as it were. So we're going to start off right with the very first thing of this play, which is the rabbi's opening monologue. Uh, and and so we're going to dive into that. So is it cor so is the rabbi correct in saying you don't live in America? No such place exists. What implications does this monologue have for the rest of the play that follows? Alicia, I'll let you start this one. I knew I was going to start this one for some reason. <laughs> um, okay, so when I saw this question, uh, I had to watch the rabbi's monologue at the beginning of the play again, because I, mm -hmm. when I first watched it, I just wasn't in it. I wasn't really paying attention. Yeah. I was trying to figure out what's going on. Where are the angels? Um, so I... <laughs> That's got to be one of the best, like, taglines for this play, part one. Where are the angels? Why does it come at the end? I was promised to angels. Where are they? <laughs> so Alicia I, Plummer. <laughs> exactly. Right? Um, so I was a little like, okay, let me listen to this monologue one more time. Um, and I don't know exactly what the rabbi meant by that. But I, I just start to think, like, let me really analyze this monologue you do not live in America, no such place exists. And then I started to think um, the rabbi is is essentially like uh, at some sort of funeral or memorial for a woman who is Jewish, an immigrant Jewish woman. So then I started to think we are all foreigners when we're living in America, I started to connect the dots there. Um, and then I and then the monologue that the rabbi had also made me think of Lewis's monologue with Belize about mm -hmm. politics and racism in America, because that also kind of ran with a, for, with a, a similar length of time. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, I wasn't sure how to digest the rabbi's introduction at the very beginning of the play. It, maybe, I also kind of wrote down, maybe it set up that, it's setting up the audience to let them know that the events that are happening are, um, fantastical and a bit surreal surrealism like america doesn't exist look at these humans going through this thing that's happening is it real is it fake uh and what's real what's fake i think that's kind of what i got from that so i got a bunch of different things from that opening i, I was very unsure with what was happening though i was like i still don't get what's going on i'm liking i'm enjoying it i'm watching it mm -hmm. i did have to watch it twice though to really to really take it in and digest it Autumn, you sat with this text for, 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 for longer than any of us. So what do you think of the rabbi's monologue since you've had more time to digest it? Well, it was interesting because I haven't, I haven't read the full play in a very long time. Um, I heard it. I didn't read it. I heard it. So I heard someone else giving it to me. And at the same time, I think I wrote almost the whole monologue out as she was ran, like pause, pause. Whoa, that was great. But pause, pause. <laughs> like these lines are 
genius and speak to a lot of the work that I do about journey and, and home and mm -hmm. uh, the idea of transience mm -hmm. and how we are never, we are never in one place for a long time. And what is the meaning of home and identity and how do we embrace identity and who can validate our identity mm -hmm. really stuck out for me. And the idea that you are in a melting pot where nothing has melted and the idea of otherness mm -hmm. and uh, it's so full. It's like, it's like a, 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 um, uh, a doctoral thesis in this, uh, oh, monologue, you're like, oh my God, is this what I'm in for? If I were a regular person, I'd like uh, a non-theater person. I'd be like, oh my God, what have I got myself into? Right. I'm a heck out. I'm, a heck out. I'm, wow. I'm getting out of here. I'm out. What is this? This is worse than Shakespeare. Um, <laughs> but just that idea of transience and, you know, it got me thinking that the only place we can ever truly identify as home is within ourself. And you see the whole play is people being at odds with their own identity, which is fascinating, mm -hmm. fascinating. Mm -hmm. And it's brilliant. It's so brilliantly penned. And even the journey of the rabbi and he, like the, the struggle to find this language in that moment is palpable. And the way that, that Susan Brown does is like mind blowing. Mm -hmm. um, but it also crosses into intergenerational journey and the idea of she carried the old world on her back and she worked that earth into your bones. So we carry the identity of our ancestors and that is a part of our makeup, whether we want it to be or not. <laughs> like mm -hmm. there's all of these these this intergen like generational trauma that comes with that bone grind, like he says, grinds it into your bones, which is something quite violent. Um, it just it I need to do like a thesis on this monologue because it's it's so brilliantly written. Mm -hmm. So I think it's but I think it's about transience mm -hmm. and that idea of identity. Mm -hmm. and who we are and who we are to the world um, is and how we present ourselves to the world to hide pieces of ourselves. And every single person in this play has a secret. Yep. So you. Um, that is what this is about. This is the, the lead up in a very non- <laughs> Uh, in a very wordy way, poetic, waxing poetics, Tony Kushner way. Yeah. But it's uh, it's genius. Well, speaking of theses, Graham, what do you think of this opening monologue? I mean, what's I don't going know. on here? I don't know how I'm supposed to follow up Autumn because, like, that was such a beautiful analysis of this piece and, mm -hmm. like, of this this idea of transience and this idea of like the ground that you stand upon, which you call America, like it doesn't exist. It's all a construct and therefore is everything that exists upon it a construct. And I, I really, what really leapt off the page at me was this idea of passing of lineage, passing of traditions from one generation to the next and what we hope to pass on to the next. I think like it kind of echoes this idea of uh, Joseph and Harper talking about having a baby. And it's like, well, okay, if those two individuals were to have kids, what would happen to that child? Because <laughs> there is so much, if we're talking about intergenerational trauma, <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so I think that the rabbi, I, I also really find it interesting that the rabbi was like, I, I didn't know this woman. Like straight up is like you normally you would think like the priest or the rabbi or whoever is leading a funeral will have a personal connection with the person and just straight up is just like no nah, I didn't know this I didn't know this woman 
like <laughs> I'm here because I'm supposed to be in in a way, and it's it's also like I think that implicates the audience mm -hmm. in saying like you don't know these people, like you're just here. Like, why are you here? It, it makes me ask, like, well, why am I here watching these people who I mm -hmm. have no connection to? Um, and just makes me think of, like, well, how is that different from, like, walking out the door and seeing people on the street and engaging with people in a social circumstance? You don't know what people have gone through. You don't know what kind of earth has been ground into their bones. And you don't know what kind of ideas of lineage that they carry with them, what they hope to, because when any play deals with mortality, there's always this essence of like panic about what we leave behind. Mm -hmm. And is it memory? Is it something physical? Is it something tangible? Or is it just like stories people tell of us? So mm -hmm. I love that this, this piece primes, primes us for what to expect. And I think that it's a brilliant way to write a prologue without so much writing a prologue in, in that very Shakespearean way that I adore. Well, now I feel my answer to this question is totally in another direction. Than what Good. everybody Because, <laughs> I mean, I took this statement that the rabbi gives as, a, 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 as Kushner giving a declaration and, and a warning to the audience of this is not going to be your idealized America. This is not going to be yay America, go America play. This is going to be an America play that is grimy, dirty, seedy. It's going to show the gross underbelly of what this country is. We're not going to be all patriotic in this. And, and, and everybody's going to walk away seeing like, like um, Yankee Doodle here. It's going to be one of these things where people are going to be like, nope, we're, no, we're, no, we're, we're going to see the worst parts of our country. Where it's the corrupt government, the mistreatment of the LGBTQIA plus community, the the ignorance of uh, of, of like organized religion, and, and and the total disinterest that the world had uh, uh, with the AIDS crisis in the early '90s, like it was Kushner going, "Listen, you come in to see this show, we're gonna get into some heavy, really bad shit here. You know what, America, you're not great. Like I, I, I'm sure we had the Reagan years where, like." Stocks were going up. Capitalism was going up. We, 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 we George H. W. Bush had his war in the Middle East that he had won. Clinton went. Uh, Clinton was coming in with this with his saxophone. Literally, like one year after this play, like, hey, America, you were like, America was chugging, man. Like, uh, 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 it was the hip hop place to be. Everybody gets to come in and 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 succeed. Kind of like what the engineer says in Miss Saigon. I want to come like live the American dream of success and prosperity. And then it's like, this place like, no, America is a place that's going to beat you, hurt you, twist you, destroy you and leave you broken by the end. Like Roy Cohn. It's Roy a place Cohn. where no one belongs. Yep. Mm. Yep. Nobody fits in. Everybody is out to get one another. Doesn't matter race, religion. Everybody's out to undercut. The and, other person in this. And yet we're told that it's like a place of acceptance where everyone can come and anyone can yep. succeed. Like that's the biggest lie I ever heard. Right. And that's what Kushner's and, and for me, like the Kushner uses the rabbi eulogizing this because he's talking because the rabbi's talking to the generations, right? Because he lists all the different grandchildren, great grandchildren. And it's like he's he's basically saying to all of them, like, sure, like your grandma came over on the boat. And, and and brought the world on her back but doesn't matter when she came here she was promised something did it come true probably not she probably lay she probably came off the boat like onto ellis island lived in the like uh, lived in a hovel had to like starve and, and and scrimp by to make some money just to get by maybe she made a little bit of money to get herself a decent place with a husband and, and a family that they could kind of survive on but clearly she clearly she didn't like become the billionaire that everybody was promised when they came to America. They didn't become the JP Morgans or, 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 or the Macy's department store people. Very few people get to be the Roy Cohen's of the world. But Roy Cohen wasn't even Roy Cohen because he was hiding. 
right? Well, you- once again, that's exactly it. It's it's that it's that it's that fallacy of America that even Roy Cohn, who looked successful, was just was destructed. Well, was and destroyed. and someone even I think it's Lewis. Does Lewis say to Joe, the Reagans aren't a happy family? Like, yes. What what is great about Kushner is no one is safe. Mm-hmm. No one is safe. Yeah. And no one belongs yeah. because the only place you can ever truly belong is in your own shell. Yeah. And I think he's making that statement. Mm -hmm. And how can you do that when the world is telling you you're terrible and awful and don't belong all the time? Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I saw this monologue was, was it, it, it was basically Kushner declaring almost war on the audience going, Get ready, like we're going deep and we're going hard here. This is not going to be a patriotic fun piece. This is no hip hip hooray. Music. I wonder, but, like, I wonder how many people sitting in an audience listened to that monologue and l- heard it. Not a lot, I guarantee it, because that's right. like, like as Alicia said, she had to go back and rewatch the monologue a few times. You had to write it down. This line gets lost within this bigger eulogy that the rabbi gives, and yet it's the one line that's going to drive the entire piece almost. That's right. And Kushner hides it, just like how America's hiding the truth the entire that's time. Right. That's right. Yeah. Which makes him genius. Yes. Agreed. All right. Well, let's dive into the next question, Ooh. which is, how does the play depict people with diverse political and or religious viewpoints and identities? Autumn, I'll let you start this one. Oh, geez. I mean, it's all out there. It's ugly. Mm-hmm. It's it's an ugly mess of a play. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what makes it brilliant, right? Mm-hmm. There's not, you know, they, they confront anti-Semitism, racism, homophobia, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, it, everything, um, Mormonism, um, you know, a very American religion. Yes, but it, it's a Republicanism, mm-hmm. uh, d- democracy, the, like the seed of democracy. Everything is under his, uh, sharp pen. Mm-hmm. And I, I love that. Nothing is safe. It's just a, a, there is a lot of questions mm-hmm. in this piece. And it's people in this very ugly mm-hmm. world. And that, uh, that's what I wanted to say about the last question is I hate this production because it doesn't get to the ugly. It performs the ugly it doesn't get to the ugly Mm -hmm. and i that is what uh, i think i think this production does this play a very massive Mm -hmm. disservice Mm -hmm. and i don't think it gets to the point Mm -hmm. that we were discussing in the monologue it Mm -hmm. doesn't it doesn't it's it should be an exhumation of america it -hmm. should be that grinding and i didn't get a grind but it it does it deals um well i'm get well is such a tepid word <laughs> um, i don't mean well it, i mean it's ugly it's ugly he's great at writing poetic ugliness mm-hmm. so i think you know maybe belize isn't is anti-semitic and lewis mm-hmm. is definitely racist but they're still characters struggling in this world and putting questions out there. And at, like, we see them in this muck and mire of that conversation and it's ugly and there's no resolution to it, which is every conversation we're having now and always, mm-hmm. right? There's, there's, no, there's no end to this conversation seemingly. Because we are a smirking nation living under the tyranny of fear and fine, as Mark Rothko would say in the play, Rick. <laughs> right? Yeah. And covering up. And, 
what, what Kushner does is he removes the blanket and goes here. This is, it's here. Yeah. Go home and talk about it. <laughs> Doesn't <laughs> offer solutions. Yeah. And I love that. And good theater should not offer solutions. It shouldn't tell people how to think. Well, unfortunately, a lot does. Yeah. Alicia, what are your thoughts on this question? Alrighty. So my thoughts on, like, I'm going to read the question out again so I have some clarification for myself. How does the play depict people with diverse political and or religious viewpoints and identities? Uh, Tony just throws everything in there and says, have fun and leaves. So that's basically what happens. Um, as I was seeing, um, as I was hearing things like Mormons can't be gay, Mormons mm -hmm. um, can't be addicted to Valium, this, this, that, wrong, everything is wrong. I was sitting there watching this, like, things like this happen. These things happen. No judgment. Things, things happen in Happening. Life. Happening. And they're still happening. Uh, things, uh, horrible things happen to people and mm -hmm. people are closeted and they, they and it, this is still mm -hmm. relevant information. And I, I just wanted to give like all the characters a hug the entire time because they were just so judgmental of themselves, themselves and they're bringing it out to others. And it was just, it was very stressful to watch at times because I felt horrible for all the characters. And I felt bad for all the characters. Mm -hmm. Um as well as I wrote down Roy being a power hungry, older white man refuses to believe he is gay. Even after he is like, um, uh, do we have, can we say spoilers in this? I'm assuming everyone yes. has watched Angels in America. But, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, after he goes to the doctor, the doctor explains to him that he is dying from AIDS and he like mm -hmm. tries to convince, convince the doctor that it's cancer and it. It's just, everything is so messed up and twisted and, Obviously, it's there on purpose to kind of uh, make the audience think like, is that is that how it just made me think as an audience member, is that how I treat other people to make them feel that they need to hide themselves? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't I don't as a Alicia Plummer, I do not do that to other people. But like when I was watching that play, I'm thinking, is this how people feel they need to hide themselves? Like, do people feel they can't be? real i don't know does that make sense like i just yeah there's just so much going on in this play that i was thinking i was thinking how do how am i as a person in society how yeah. how have i contributed how can i do better and that's how it made me feel and um one last thing that i wrote down was the, the lewis and belize conversation i brought up so many times but it really stuck out to me because i i didn't think racism would be brought up in the play um, I, I had read the play a while ago and I forgot, I guess I just forgot about the scene, but it was nice to have it in there because, uh, at first I was really, I was rooting for Lewis's character. And then he had this really long monologue about politics and conservatism and racism was thrown in there. And it was almost just like, I didn't think Belize was going to say anything, but then he did say something and then they had a huge argument and it was just nice to hear that like Lewis has his own imperfections and just because he's completely against Reagan and completely against conservatism doesn't mean he can't be racist. So I, I just thought that was really cool to put that in there and it mm -hmm. kind of put a mirror to everyone and, mm -hmm. um, and make them think like, Hey, you have good qualities. You have bad qualities that you need to work on in life. Um, yeah. I also wrote, Oh, and one last thing. Um, I wrote down Lewis seemed to have a judgmental tone when it came to Belize doing drag, which I feel is very 90s. And now it being 2021, I think drag is more open than it used to be. Um, yeah, that relates. I think that relates to this conversation. Basically, everyone's judging everybody in this play. And it's very open. And it, as an audience member, it made me think about everything that I've said to everyone in, like throughout my entire life. So very powerful impression on me. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought up the drag uh, bit. There mm -hmm. are two things I just want I want to I want to say here because it is it is he does throw everything at the wall and Lewis bless him just a mess of a human being. <laughs> oh yes, yep. 
But the idea that they're both self-deprecating about doing drag and exploring that femininity and and that part of their identity um, is very striking and how that was perceived and judged and how we still judge people based on their um, gender attributes is um, very interesting. Um, and also the fact that Roy Cohn, I, I had to look this up as, as Alicia was talking, but Roy Cohn was Jewish. So that was another huge part of his identity. And his father was a very strong proponent of the Democratic Party. So his early beginnings and a judge. So it's interesting. His that struggle, that backstory, I think is very relevant and I don't think present in um, Mr. Lane's performance, but that's okay, whatever. Um, I'm not going to judge him. We're in a, <laughs> a, a wave of non-judgment, but to fully realize him, I think that that struggle has to be present from the very beginning, right? That idea of you know, being a Jewish man in Republican politics when your father was a Democrat. Mm -hmm. Very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Very fascinating. Those yep. are my two thoughts mm -hmm. on that. Graham? So what I love about this play is that it presents everyone as flawed and no one is safe from the pen. And that's what I really appreciate because I feel like Today, especially when you meet someone who has an opinion that differs from you, it's very, very quick to put, like, people are very, very quick to put up a wall, shut them down. They don't want to talk to them. They don't want to, like, they don't, they, they just, I'm like, I don't want to engage because we're going to disagree. Except that when you have conversations with people who you disagree with, you can sometimes understand your own theories a bit better. You can sometimes come to a mutual understanding. And ultimately, we want people to talk because if people don't talk, mm -hmm. that's when it gets dangerous that's when it gets to places of like that is where we can get in cases of segregation again of like saying like we have to divide society because if we have people who disagree mm -hmm. communicating we will have open bloodshed in the streets and i'm like well <clears throat> anyways but i like that everyone is presented and you have like characters who are gay but also republican and you have this Democrat who is also incredibly racist and judgmental and honestly I don't like Lewis as a character I thought he was whiny I thought he was snivelly I thought he was and then that monologue was just like nail in the coffin I'm like I don't like you <laughs> like I, I don't like you at all like I remembered that from from the HBO series I'm like I didn't like you then I don't like you now um but I think that it's important to show because to show a people of different kinds and even to as the writer and this is really difficult as a writer you have to present people who have different opinions than you and fight for them as a character even if you disagree with everything they stand for you have to make them seem real and you have to make them seem believable to the audience and it's really hard to if you're writing let's say a genocidal maniac it's really hard to believe that the genocidal maniac is right but if you want the audience to believe that genocidal maniac, you need to, as the writer, when you're writing them, like they think they are the hero of their story because everyone's the hero of their own story. And I kind of like that about Angels in America and that everyone is the hero of their own story. I can't exactly point to any one character and say, you are the protagonist because yeah. it is such an ensemble play. You do get moments of where I'm like, Maybe Harper's the main character. And then I'm like, no, it's very clearly prior. Nah, actually, it's Lewis. Hey, wait a minute. What about Joe? <laughs> what about Joe? Like, everyone has, it's kind of a very nice to see how they all share time and space on stage. And they are different. And that's okay because guess what? Society in this melting pot where nothing has melted, mm -hmm. there are so many different kinds of people. And if anything, I think Tony Kushner did a great job of mm -hmm. subverting and defying stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Like there's this thought that it's impossible for you to be conservative if you're gay because mm -hmm. the gay community allies themselves with the left 
like the left side of the political spectrum. And it's like, well, if you're gay, you must automatically believe in this. You must automatically believe in that. I'm like, no, no, no. Don't put gay people in a box. <laughs> like, don't like don't put anyone in a box because there are all sorts of different kinds of people. And I think what I like best is that everyone is flawed. There is no person who is put on a pedestal. There is no person who is better, except I might say Belize. Like Belize is one of my favorite characters. Like always has been, always will be. Um, because I also what I love about that scene is what I love about Kushner in general is like because my problem as a playwright is people always tell me to shut up. People always tell me, like, you're too long, you need to cut it back, you need to condense, you need to be shorter. But what I love about Kushner is he, like, just had this big rambling monologue from Lewis where Belize, quite understandably, I'm like, I've been in your shoes where someone is just talking and talking and talking. You're just like... <clears throat> and then they say things like, thank you. And then you're like, now I really, like, I'm going like, to walk out of this coffee shop. Like, I've been there. But then he gets the chance to answer, which I think is very important, is that every character gets the chance to answer. So yeah, I think that the great the greatest thing is that to view, remember that humans as a species are flawed mm -hmm. and not shy away from it, not gloss it over, not polish it up, but mm -hmm. humanity is flawed. And that's what I think Kushner does so beautifully. Can I say uh, something? Can I yes. say something about that? Mm -hmm. um, Graham, that was that was so beautifully stated. Uh, and he does. And, and Mackenzie Horner and I have had this uh, conversation many times <laughs> about villains. And the fact that we can never, as creators that are putting characters on stage, we can never vilify them. We have to honor their full journey because every villain what is a perception by somebody else. There, there is something to the fact that, you know, Tony Kushner highlights in this play with each of these characters that we must approach them with empathy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that he has created a play where he states that it is a melting pot where nothing has melted. None mm -hmm. of these characters melt together, mm -hmm. which is a revelation. Beautiful addition. Yeah. I mean, what I appreciate about what Tony Kushner did in this piece was that he was that he didn't take the easy route of just making the Republicans the bad guys. No of this play everybody uh graham as you said is flawed and has their demons and darker sides that that, that 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 nobody is perfect nobody on the left or the right atheist or jewish or mormon or catholic uh is perfect no system no one is, is perfect, perfect. yes no one is that's perfect and I, and I think nowadays we all can fall very quickly into the category of the right are the bad guys. They are just downright evil people. And for the most part, some of them do really horrible, horrible things. But once again, we can't just why cope brush it over because then you're not engaging in, in the conversation. That's odd on something you've talked about with me. My dad talks about me, well, my dad and I debate this all the time where he goes, Mac, you can't be just one-sided. Read up, study, and and come in to, 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 to a discussion open. I forget which episode, Autumn, on the podcast we were on, but you, you, you said that so well where it's basically like, you don't get, don't come into a conversation looking to convert or change someone. You come in with an open heart and an open mind to talk and engage. Now, sometimes that can be really hard, but it's the thing of autumn, as you said, like you gotta bite your tongue, you gotta listen and you gotta engage because not listening and not engaging it is is, 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 is is where we are now, where there's a big partisan divide in Canada, in the States, all over the world. We're all boxist, where we all like to live in our little echo chambers where we all agree with, with each other and we don't hear the other side. We have lost the center. And what Kushner does in this play is he finds the center because he goes, mm. 
everybody is screwed up. Everybody has darker underbellies to them. The left is not perfect. The right is not perfect. Everybody Nobody is perfect. human. Everyone human. is human. And we've lost sight that people are human in that. And, and, that, and that one thing does not define an entire person. Mm -hmm. Just because, hey, you voted for Doug Ford doesn't mean you are just somebody who voted for Doug Ford. You could be a whole lot of other things. You could be a teacher who, 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 who also has a child with Down syndrome. You could be so many other things in here that make up who you are. I mean, Autumn, we were talking about, I forget which thing we were talking about. You were said like, I am not just a woman. I am not just someone who identifies as lesbian. I am not just a director. I am not just a step parent. I am a smorgasbord. I have my own melting pot. You are, exactly. And that's exactly yes. it for Graham and Alicia. Everybody is their own melting pot of different things that make up who you are. And until we rip off our band-aids and actually start showing all sides of ourselves, we all learn and grow. Like the fact that we do get that great conversation between uh, beliefs in Lewis where they're letting their bad sides fly and they're not closing the curtain like that's how we got Trump in the first place it's nobody wanted to come out and say yeah I voted for Trump everybody was like if I say that then I get canceled if I say that then nobody talks to me we instead of engaging like them. why did you vote for him why did that happen because mm -hmm. systemically we are trained to lose our curiosity about the world. Mm -hmm. It happens when we are forced into a desk mm -hmm. with a piece of paper and a pencil. We are told not to talk. We are told to raise our hands. We are told to fit into mm -hmm. a row. Mm -hmm. That is what happens. Mm -hmm. Snap, snaps. I yep. agree, Graham. And in, and in that, it trains us to reject anything other than the system. Mm -hmm. So we just yeah. need to dismantle systems. That's easy, right? <laughs> so easy, Autumn. Let's just go do that after we're done recording. I've got an hour. Oh, maybe yeah. a half an hour. I got my wrench. Done. Yeah, let's do it. I got I'm, my drill. I'm down. I got my coffee. Yes. So. Ah. Ah. Perfect. More coffee. <laughs> More coffee. And then the Yes. Exactly. All right, let's dive into the final question. The most ethical question that I think will be most personal to everybody here. Because there is no right or wrong answer to this one. Not that there's been right or wrong answers prior to this. But it deals with the character of Lewis. And in the play, Lewis leaves Pryor at the hospital in Pryor's, what we can say is his biggest moment of need. And Lewis bolts for a better term of a word he bolts and so the question is was he justified in this and is a person morally obligated to stay with a dying partner and what would you do honestly under these circumstances alicia i see you flinching so i want you to go first <laughs> Which ah. you're cruel. You are so cruel. Oh gosh. Oh god. Okay. I'm flinching because Autumn and I and I Graham, I don't know if you were also in this discussion when we were briefly talking about this. He not on camera. In. He clips back in. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So I wrote down this is a lot. This is a really big question to end on, Mackenzie, and I'm a little mm -hmm. upset that it's even in here. But <laughs> we have to discuss it. We have to discuss it. Um yeah. Okay. Well, I Ron don't... and I, when we wanted this question, we were like, well, we got to address Lewis and Pryor in this yeah. moment. And, and, it's, and it's too simple to do, is he justified? We had to go, we had to excavate deeper into this question. So, yes. yes. Drill down, Alicia, drill down. Oh, okay. Um, I don't want to shame Lewis for leaving Pryor. Mm -hmm. All right. Because when I, like, you, I could sense that he was going to leave. It mm -hmm. was so obvious that he wasn't capable of dealing with um, prior circumstances of his sickness. Mm -hmm. So when he left during the hospital scene, when he told the nurse, I'm out, if mm -hmm. when he wakes up or if he wakes up, tell him I am gone. Mm -hmm. I wasn't surprised. I think that's why I was like, honestly, he needs to go. Lewis needs to step away. Cause he also kind of started to derail later on in the play. And he obviously wasn't doing well. 
he was doing better than prior, of course, but he wasn't doing well mentally. Um, but one thing I didn't like, like, I, I really didn't like how Lewis left, but he didn't really leave. He was still having coffee with Belize, really? Could you just like, ex like leave the play now? You've left prior. I, why are you still here? Like, it was just awkward to still see him hang around in the play, talking mm -hmm. to Joe. Like, every time I saw him on, on screen, I'm just thinking your boyfriend is dying. I get that you had to leave, but I don't want to see you around anymore. It's embarrassing at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, I, I understand why he stepped away from the relationship because it was, he, he just couldn't prepare to deal with um, him, his sickness. I don't know if it was justified. I don't know. Um, like from now I have to answer the other part of the question. If I would do that in, in those circumstances. Prior and um, Lewis were dating for four years. So that must mean something. And I think I'm pretty sure I would stay. I'm pretty sure I would stay. Like it, it terrifies me to answer the question because I, I feel like I'm answering honestly. I, I think I would. Like I'm in love with this person. And like through thick and thin at this point this is my partner in life i would stay and i would help them as painful as it would be because it because knowing that i i wasn't there during their last months of living or weeks or whatever or knowing i could have been there to help ease the pain that would that that memory would not sit well with me for the rest of my life so i know i would stay but i also understand why lewis left um but it, it just i found it very distracting to still see him throughout the play it's just like he, he can, his character can be executed now. We're done with him. Um, so yeah, I, uh, it's a complicated question though, but ultimately I would say, yeah. Yeah, Autumn, I see Autumn just like <laughs> chomping here. Like she's here ready we to go. Well, I was listening question. to Alicia and I, it dawned on me what Lewis is. Mm -hmm. Lewis well. is Tony Kushner's commentary on the Uber left. Hmm. Because he is a democratic mouthpiece who thinks he knows everything and the way the world should work through a very myopic lens. And he appropriates pain and identity. Mm. Sound familiar? Anyone? Wow. Did not see Lewis that way. That is a whole mm -hmm. new perspective on Lewis. Yeah, he is there to go, poor me, poor me. My partner has AIDS. Poor me, poor me. I'm going to run away from it. Everyone feels sorry for me. I'm mm -hmm. going to talk a lot. I'm going to talk a lot. It's the Uber left. Mm -hmm. It's a commentary on how destructive that is and how it just is inactive. Even him leaving with Joe at the end, well, they've, they've not had a real conversation. It's just like, oh, well, yeah, you're cute. Okay, let's they go. They yelled at each other. And I'm like, it's the Uber left. It's like social commentary on the Uber left. Way to go, Kushner. I don't, maybe it wasn't even thoughtful, but that is how I'm in today, like with a 2021 sensibility and watching people with their Band-Aid solutions and their Facebook posts and, oh, I'm so good. Look at me. I'm posting things. I'm making, what are you doing to make the change possible? Nothing. But you're good at talking about it. That is what I want to say. So what about the next part of the question, Adam, of, is a person morally obligated to stay with a dying partner? No, and what would you no, do in those are, circumstances? No, we are all, we are all our own entities. Mm -hmm. um, if there might be intergenerational trauma, there might be present trauma that, per, you know, prohibits you from doing mm -hmm. such a thing. Mm -hmm. um, um, we are all um, masters of our own choices. Mm -hmm. But we also have to... Um, recognize that there are uh, consequences for our choices. Mm -hmm. um, I would not make this choice. I would never, I would never even think of making this choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think of it in my own world, but 
you know, I'm I'm one of those pessimists that are like, well, if I'm if this gets too ugly, maybe I'll be alone. I'm always mm. that person. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> terrible. <laughs> but like it's that's it's a lot. It is a lot. And to see someone struggling might be too much for some people. Mm-hmm. And I'm mm-hmm. not here to judge that choice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but there will be enough self-judgment of that choice. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I would I would not choose it. Mm-hmm. Um, like if something happened to one of the kids or Sarah or, or an animal, um, because I would never want anyone to be alone mm-hmm. and hurting. That is mm-hmm. awful. Mm-hmm. That is an awful... For me, that's awful. It's it's not so much about the pain. It's about the loneliness. And you're already feeling lonely because you're the only person going through that. But to be abandoned in that time of need, I think absolutely not. Alicia? Um, something, Autumn, that uh, brought up that made me realize I forgot to mention um, if I am in love with this person, definitely, without a doubt, I am staying. But if I'm not in love with that person, to be to be honest, I don't think I would stay. I don't I don't think that was the case with Lewis. He seemed like he was in love with Pryor. Yeah. Um, so that was his his personal choice. But I think that also comes into mind when I have to think like, will I stay or will I go? The love factor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like, we can't, we don't know other, like their relationship, mm-hmm. like maybe it was horrible and maybe this is a chance for them to reclaim some sense of themselves. We all have to make hard choices. And I say that because something happened to me recently where I became aware of uh, an illness that impended someone that I was with for a very long time and I had to make the very difficult choice to not reach out because the consequence of reaching out um, means something very different. And it's not that I, I lack um, empathy. It's just I am aware of cycles of manipulation that also happen. So we don't know the inner mechanics of their relationship or what has transpired. But the way Kushner has penned Lewis, it's, for me, it's very evident that he is about himself. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, that, that selfishness of the nineties of that, you know, where, you know, he's, he's damning Republicans, but he's also making very interesting choices, which make him, human Mm -hmm. right um and i think you know i think as much as i don't like him as a character i do think he's human and i think part of that for me in this version was his portrayal Mm -hmm. and you know there is something about lewis that we don't talk about the his faith does come into Mm -hmm. play with that character trajectory, the the guilt and the, you know, uh, that that thing that is grinded into the cultural bone, right? Mm-hmm. And how, you know, how um, structurally things are supposed to be in in uh, the Jewish faith and in Jewish relationships. Mm-hmm. And he's already gone against that by being gay. So he's you know, and disease and what is the disease and does he have the disease? Like there are more factors in that, in that um, character that really need to be honed. I just don't think it was evident in this Lewis. And I, that, that's hard because this actor is very good. I've seen him in other things. He, he was just in the um, movie uh, Ammonite with Kate Winslet and Sarah Sheridan. Um, And he Mm -hmm. was wonderful. He was wonderful and understated. I just felt he was acting American. Mm. So I, I think, I think his journey wasn't, I don't think we got his full journey, but I do think it's a, I do think it's a statement. Mm. Yeah. 
Graham. We're taking up the rear on the most difficult question, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> which, I mean, works for the best for me because I get to listen to some awesome responses first. Um, but <clears throat> is Lewis justifying leaving? I have to agree with Autumn in that like, if he's answering to himself, then I think he's justified. However, that being said, however, I don't think he is because Lewis throughout the play has just been illustrating how afraid he is. And as soon as things started to get messy and dirty, like he was already checking out. I, I like, I think he left prior, like right from the scene in the cemetery. Like, I think he started mm -hmm. checking out then. So in a way, and I know this won't make Pryor feel better because Pryor's in the hospital stricken with, a a a little, stricken with AIDS. Um, so he's probably not thinking like, you know, like he probably thinks like, I want my boyfriend. And you know, like mm -hmm. in the last scene who shows up to dance with him, like Lewis shows up because Pryor is still in love with Lewis. They've been together mm -hmm. for four years. You know, like me, if I were like Pryor's friend, I'd be like, you don't need that lousy bum because he's just thinking of leaving you just because things are getting like your relationship is no longer convenient your relationship is no longer easy flowing it's it, it's times of hardship and struggle that a relationship gets tested and people in general get tested and then you get to find out what they're made of and i think what we saw with lewis is that he's made a pretty weak stuff he will run away and then immediately come back with some very long winged rambling monologue because he's going to just talk over anyone who would dare to talk against him like that's all i saw i'm like wow you need to shut up <laughs> and that's it i'm like oh my god lewis shut up i love monologues shut up because <laughs> also the fact that it, it wasn't a civil conversation that ended this between them mm -hmm. it was a shouting match it, and not only that it was a he disappeared he hooked up with a guy in a park and then he went to the hospital and yelled mm. at his boyfriend who was in a hospital bed. I'm sorry. Mm. I don't feel bad for you. Never <laughs> did. I thought you were awful. Um, mm. And now I just, it's just confirmed. Um, I also think of another one of the rabbi's lines. Catholics believe in forgiveness. Jews believe, believe in guilt. I'm like, yeah, that. I think Lewis is taking that to heart. I'm like, oh, well, you need to be feel guilty about something? Or is, is that, will that make you feel better? Because, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. forgiveness is found inside yourself. Like, if you can't forgive yourself, no one can. But mm -hmm. that's a side tangent. Um, next part of the question, is a person morally obligated? That, again, responds to, like, who are they? Like, I mm -hmm. think that it's definitely admirable to stay with someone who is dying, but people know their own capacity. I would have more respect for Lewis if he's like, I don't have the capacity to deal with this. I'm not emotionally mature enough. I'm not like, I'm not equipped. If he were to say, I'm not equipped to handle this and have, and talk to prior like an adult, then I might like, I might have more respect for him, but he, he acted very childish through it. And, so yeah, like you want to stay with people and, and also they were together for four years. That is not just like, if, if you're together with someone for like four months and then this big diagnosis comes up and then you have to ask like, okay, I like just met this person. I don't, there's probably so much about them I still don't know. Mm -hmm. Then you can have that debate of like, do you stay, do you go? But when it's four years, you are past that initial infatuation stage. Mm -hmm. You are past like, you know, you've probably had fights before especially because Pryor did drag and Lewis has already had disparaging things to say about drag. So we can assume that there's probably fights there. Like they've probably had fights. They've had a relationship. I, th I think Lewis should have stuck in a little bit longer, but at the same time, I think Pryor's better off without him because you don't want a weak partner for going through something this hard, especially at the time. And that's what we have to factor in is, I need to, in the third part of the question, would, what would I do in this situation? I have to ask, what would I do in the situation at the time period of the play? And what would I do now? Because now I know that AIDS is not a death sentence. Now I know that there is treatment. Now I know there is medication that can help people. 
and like people can live well into old age. Like it's, it's not this scary boogeyman anymore. So now I'd probably be more inclined to stay at the time when there were uncertainties. And if I were out and proud at the time, a lot of my friends had probably been stricken by it and probably been dying and probably been afflicted. Would, it, would self-preservation kick in at the time? This, this is, I don't know, because I am a very preservationist kind of person. But you know, it, it would really depend on the circumstance. Like, how long have I known this person? Do I love them? Just like Alicia said, like, the love factor is a big deal. Um, and if you're together with someone for four years, like, you've clearly bonded with this person. You've clearly, like, made the commitment that you're – with them through thick and thin, because even though you might not have a legally binding contract, doesn't matter. Like uh, you have a personally binding contract with this person because you said, yeah, said for four years I'm sticking with you. For four years I'm I'm going to be with you through thick and thin, through times when I can't make rent, through times when like my mom dies, through times when like, you know, hardship strikes and through the good times when we can just like lounge about on a blanket in the park and drink rosé out of water bottles, you know, like. It's so interesting though. I, Graham, I'm so glad you said that because I, like you look at four years, four years is a long time. Mm -hmm. And for him to just get up and walk away from the relationship to me is kind of astounding um, and so it makes me start to wonder what was their relationship? Did Lewis dominate? Was Pryor like he gave up drag and he loved drag. Like in his dream with Harper, he's getting into drag and he says, oh, uh, you know, you're really down when even drag is a drag. So he enjoyed the, mm -hmm. that performance mm -hmm. element and doing drag so why why did that go away in his life right mm -hmm. like there's like what kind of relationship did they have where he can just disappear without without hesitation like mm -hmm. i don't he doesn't really hesitate and the idea of guilt and you know it, it's so, so funny that kushner writes uh, Catholics are forgiven. There's also a lot of guilt in Catholicism, which is <laughs> very fascinating. Um, but what, what I recognize about guilt is that it's like anger. It is a reaction, not a response. Mm -hmm. So therefore it becomes inactive and about self rather than about the perpetuation of change with others. Um, it's interesting, just just playing off what Graham said about guilt and that that line, um, and their relationship. Like I don't like, I don't know. There's I have questions about their relationship, and mm -hmm. he is better off. He is better yeah. off with Belize and someone. Yeah. But and it's about how they didn't melt together because they didn't yeah. see each other. Mm -hmm. Right. They saw versions of what they wanted the other person to be. And that's not mm -hmm. a good relationship, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. was it about the convenience of being with someone and being in a stable relationship? Mm -hmm. And I also think about like how these two were very different individuals to very different reflections of what gay men can look like. Like prior, I got the sense was this like fabulous queen who had no problem strutting down the street and like, owning it whereas lewis i kind of get the sense that he's more of the um like homo normative well adapted person who wears a suit to work and has a desk job and like talk like talks like you and me and like is so normal because you know heteronormativity like I, i'm putting lots of like just bunny ear everything i'm saying right here <laughs> just um and they uh, these are two very conflicting sides of the gay community like I think about a meme I saw about the the bachelor who just came out as gay. And it's like, oh yeah, so this like straight passing guy comes out and he gets a TV show, whereas there are so many people who never passed who are just kind of like pebbles in the stone that Colton Underwood is now gets to 
climb to success all, be, all because he's straight passing all because he's like i don't know popular and pretty and like fits this ideal of the gay community because there's a lot of self-loathing about how how gay men speak or how gay men act and we don't want to like, there's a lot of hate against femme individuals because it's like, well, if I wanted to be with someone feminine, I'd just be with a woman. And that is so disrespectful to femme guys. Like, yeah. So I struggle with this question a lot because, because, because this, brought, this question brought me back to two years ago when my grandmother was in hospice for 18 days. And seeing the entire family go through this experience and all the different reactions that people had made me think of Lewis in this moment of clearly he clearly there is some type of love he had with prior. Don't know what it was, but the minute you get to this point where when Lewis leaves prior, he thinks he's dead basically like on death's door, maybe hours left to live at this point, not, gonna get better and it makes me think of certain family members i had who had to stop coming to the hospice because they went i can't see my grandmother in this state anymore so i i can't i can't go to that place it doesn't mean i did doesn't mean i didn't stop caring about them but i just can't go there while i went every weekend and sat and for hours so it made me go like I couldn't answer. I, I really struggle with the answer question. Is Lewis justified? Cause I go, I don't think Lewis mentally was in a place to handle that situation. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter if it was four years, 10 years. I think Lewis is someone who doesn't handle that situation. Well, doesn't matter how much he loved prior that situation right from the get go of the beginning of that play, right after the eulogy, you can tell he's overwhelmed with the fact that his partner's going to die. In that, and that basically his partner has a death sentence on him. And it's the thing of, I don't know, eventually, like he just got to the point where it's like, just couldn't go any step further in that moment and, 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 and sit in the hospital room and watch your partner fade. Not knowing if they're going to wake up, just watch them flatline, basically. Mm. And it made me, and it made me really go, on one hand, I wouldn't, like, I know I personally wouldn't do it. Because I am the one who did this in the hospice room every weekend. But I know some people just couldn't do it because of the pain that was going to come on to them and the trauma that was going to happen in that moment, being there. So I just went, oh, this is that tough. I mean, yeah, this question just brought up so many personal yeah. struggles in this moment of, I just went, well, I don't agree with what, with, with, with what Pryor did. I think Kushner wrote Lewis in such a way that it was clear that Lewis was somebody struggling and just couldn't handle the, the, con the concept of death and what that would mean for him and his partnership. And he just kind of went, I'm out. Like, I just can't be in the room anymore. And so we went on a very destructive path doing what he did. And it's, and it's awful to see what happens in this relationship. Cause there was a four year relationship. As Autumn said, it's a questionable relationship because of what the, because of what prior goes through and what Lewis goes through. But I just go, it's it's hard to judge Lewis knowing that just some people can't be in that space. Doesn't matter how much they love someone. Sometimes you just can't be there. And I just go, I can't. I once again, and you can't judge someone for that because that's their journey. That's their part of their melting pot. We don't know what happened to Lewis. Maybe he he already sat in a hospice with someone dying, or maybe he sat in enough hospital rooms watching his friends die during this AIDS uh, uh, epidemic. And he just went, I don't know if I can handle sitting in another room watching somebody else die. I don't know. Cause that's because she doesn't answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, I just think anyone that can't sit in that room is not mm -hmm. consumed with um, the other person. They're consumed with their own needs in that moment. Mm -hmm. So, I, I'm not passing judgment on that, yep. but that is the choice. It, it is a choice. It is, it is a choice. And any relative, mm -hmm. whether it be about self-preservation, but I don't think it is here. Mm -hmm. I don't think Pryor was a bad partner. Mm -hmm. I think 
but we don't know. Yeah. But I think I think that in a way it's just indicative of his character and mm -hmm. he, as as Graham said, you know, that that lack of maturity mm -hmm. that Lewis embodies. Right? Mm -hmm. That yeah. He's he's entitled. Yeah. He's an He is. Yeah, yeah, Lewis mm -hmm. is a very yeah. entitled cent self-centered character, which is why I kind of lean more on the side of I don't really like what he does. I, I don't agree with what he does, but I go, I can't fully judge him and go, you were wrong because I think there's a lot more X factors to that character that, that, that lead that, that I, an actor would have to make. And, and I agree with you, Adam. I, I don't think Lewis was well portrayed in this to give that full rounded concept of who this, of the struggle this character goes through. Cause I think this is a very human struggle that people go through on a daily basis, losing partners, losing, losing loved ones that. Mm -hmm. Parents, children. Yep. Exactly. And, Graham? and also it's like, whether we agree or disagree with what Lewis mm -hmm. did and think that he should have stayed with prior or think that mm -hmm. he is completely justified. Mm -hmm. People make this choice every day. Yep. To, cut, to cut people out of their life yeah. because of any reason. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be a sickness. It can be yep. literally anything. Mm -hmm. um, and what is great about Kushner including it in the play is that he's like, yeah, this happens. Yep. Yeah. If you don't like it, too bad. It happens. Deal with it. Yep. Like, balls in your court now, audience, because mm -hmm. there are what will so you many, do? There are what? so many Lewises in the world. We all can be a Lewis, potentially. I think this yeah. is intimacy because that is more, that is a broader question, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When it comes to relationship, I think it's a little, it could be a little bit different just because it is more intimate. Mm -hmm. Intimate, but I also go, there's a lot of X factors within that relationship that yeah. As you brought up with Lewis and Pryor, there's a lot of other X factors that drive those decisions they make. Like there well, could be as deep love as ever. You could be married to them 50 years. And then all of a sudden, when you get to this point, time is breaks the cameras marker. back. Yeah. Time is not a marker of a good relationship. It just mm -hmm. shows resiliency. Yeah. yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, I can speak from personal experience and uh, mm -hmm. 23 years of resiliency. Mm -hmm. in a situation where love was lacking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, you know, Pryor says to Lewis at one point, what is your definition of love? Mm -hmm. And I don't think Lewis knows what that is. Mm -hmm. Because love is about selflessness. Yeah. It is about being fully available and letting somebody else in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About empathy. And also judging on Lewis's character, he's very quick to, he, I think he's very stuck in his head. He's very yeah. logo space in that he, he t like through a lot of his monologues, he talks about justice and he talks about all these like big ideals and he doesn't ever come to a solid conclusion. So the fact he can't come to a solid conclusion about love, yeah, that tracks. <laughs> like mm -hmm. completely makes sense that he's too mm -hmm. busy debating love. Meanwhile, Pryor is dying. Yeah. And on that note, we can end part one of our Angels in America review. Oh, Stay tuned next week for part two of Angels in America. Whole new panel, whole new faces. But before this panel goes, we'll give everybody a chance to plug the socials, promote their goods. So Graham, we'll let you start this. Where can people find and follow you and all, and, and all your work? Uh, best place to find and follow me is Instagram. My handle is uh, at Instagram 999 uh, because, of course, it would be. And that is Graham spelled G-R-A-E-M-E -E because that is the Scottish spelling and not the English. Mm -hmm. um, so just remember 999 as in the uh, start of a new journey. Love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alicia, where can people find and follow you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram. My at is, it is Alicia Plummer. Pretty simple. 
Uh, also, if you have TikTok, follow me on TikTok. My at is hi Alicia by Alicia. I'm always on TikTok. So I think that'd be love cool that. if you followed me there. Love that. Love that. And Autumn Smith, where can they find and follow you and all your companies and businesses? Oh, my word. Um, well, you can follow me at Autumn DM Smith on Facebook and Instagram, at Littlewood Smith, and at Timber Beast Productions. So many places. Mm -hmm. I need to pare that down. I like Graham's 999. It's like the millennium approaches. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> right. Love that. Love that. Uh, you can find, follow me at Mackenzie Horner on all social media platforms. And you can follow Autumn and I's podcast, Before the Downbeat, a musical podcast where Autumn and I talk all things musical. By the time this comes out, we'll be close to wrapping up season three. Uh, and then we'll be marching our way into season four. Stay tuned. There's lots of episodes to catch up on on that. Check out the Cup of Hemlock podcast where you can catch all previous episodes, including Roundtables Graham's appeared on, Autumn's interview and Autumn's Romeo and Juliet panel, one of the many panels Alicia's been on, as well as her interview. So you can catch all these great people once again on all these other uh, on-the-go listening uh, platforms. So check all that out. Cup of Hemlock podcast. There you go. All right, everybody. We will see you all next week with part two. Until then, stay healthy, stay safe, and have a great rest of your week. <laughs>